Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and another edition of Wildlife Wednesday. My name is Harvey Webster. I'm Chief Wildlife Officer. and We've got a great special for you today. We're going to learn all about the museum's raccoon, Miko. And Miko's pretty fascinating because not only is he a raccoon, he's an albino. That is, he basically has no pigment. He looks white, kind of a light straw color with pink eyes, no pigment in the iris. Kind of an interesting thing. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn about the enrichment, the training, and all of the things that we do to take care of Miko here at the Ralph Perkins II Wildlife Center in Woods Garden, uh, presented by KeyBank, which is right on the museum's campus. And we have exciting news to tell you. On July 1st, we open back up to the public, and we encourage you to reach out to cmnh.org and get more information about that. But when you come here, you get a chance to see Miko. Raccoons are very, very common uh, sort of medium-sized or mezzo predators that we have around here, and they probably live in your own backyard, certainly in your neighborhood. And there's a lot to learn about them. So let's, without further ado, let's toss it to Nicole Episcopo. And Nicole is our Wildlife Programs Coordinator here in the uh, Wildlife Resources Division of the museum. And not only does she do animal care enrichment and training, but she also does an awful lot of the programming too. So take it away, Nicole. Everybody. Welcome back to Wildlife Wednesday. My name is Nicole and I am the Animal Programs Coordinator here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And we are out in the Ralph Perkins II Wildlife Center. And we are in front of our albino raccoon exhibit. You may have thought it was a baby polar bear, maybe an opossum. And some people even think that this is a new species called a Miko, but this is actually our albino raccoon's name. His name is Miko, named after the famous Disney character from the Pocahontas films. And we have him here in our exhibit, kind of working a little bit on some puzzles and some toys. And we'd like to give you guys a little bit of information about him and how he came to live here at the museum. And he's been here since 2015. Miko was rescued when he was a baby after being abandoned by his mother at a very young age. This is relatively common for raccoons, or baby raccoons specifically, who are a little bit different from the group, as the mother wants to make sure that the entire group of babies remains safe. If there is one that is lagging behind or an outlier that can risk the safety of the rest of the group, mom will make the choice to leave that one behind. And for Miko's condition here, he is albino, like I mentioned. Albinism removes all of the pigmentation from his fur as well as from his eyes. So instead of being that normal camouflage color of the black and gray with that signature mask, Miko is all white. And for his group and his family, that kind of makes him stick out like a sore thumb and is an easy target for predators. His mom couldn't risk that. So he was abandoned, like I said, at a young age. After being rescued and brought into a rehabilitation center, he got a little bit too used to being around people and was deemed non-releasable after imprinting. Albinism is incredibly rare, not only in humans, but in raccoons especially. Scientists estimate that one in every 750,000 raccoons is born with albinism. Albinism is a lack of pigmentation within the skin and within the hair color and eyes, um, which is causing Miko to have that very white coloration as well as kind of red beaming eyes. This means that his eyesight probably isn't very good. We know with humans, if they are albino, that their eyesight is very poor most of the time. So for raccoons, not only is their eyesight not very good to begin with, but then that also means that Miko probably doesn't have good eyesight to begin with at all. He can probably see shapes and shadows, but for the most part, he's working with his other senses, his hearing, his smell, and his ability to touch. Here at the museum, sometimes we offer Miko pieces of our hair or our hair ties to smell or pieces of our clothing in order for him to know and understand which one of us is working with him that day. He also has a very keen sense of hearing, so sometimes even from far away, he can hear a cart rolling by or people or children laughing in the background, and he picks up on those senses very easily. In some of the videos you might see of him playing with his enrichment, you'll even notice he perks his ears up every once in a while when a different sound comes by. But most importantly, for Miko, as well as all wild raccoons, their greatest sense is their sense of touch. They use their hands for everything. Touching things is almost their way of seeing things. In a couple of our videos that you'll be seeing of Miko with his enrichment today, you'll notice that he is getting things out of the water. In the wild, they call this dousing. Wild raccoons will often take the food item that they're interested in eating to a stream or a river or a pond and appear to be washing it off. That's not necessarily what they're doing. 
they get the object wet so that they can feel it a little bit better to understand exactly what they're eating. So if they're holding something, they think it's edible, they give it a wash off, they kind of feel it around, then they know that it's maybe a fish or a mouse and that it is something that they can eat. This behavior is incredibly common also in uh, raccoons that are in human care because in human care they want to exhibit that same behavior. They'll often take their food, even though it's very similar every day, over to the water dish and they wash it off daily, like that dousing behavior they do in the wild. Raccoons are omnivores, and that's a really big word for that they eat fruits, vegetables, and meat, a lot like humans do. Something that Miko gets here at the museum that he loves a whole lot is fish, and in the wild they'll eat just about anything, fish, mice, chipmunks, squirrels, you name it, if it's a meat product, they're looking for it. Fruits and veggie-wise, he loves grapes, and he also likes his biscuits. His omnivore biscuit is a lot like maybe if you gave your dog or cat at home a cat or a dog food product from a bag. In the wild, they're very, they're not picky at all. They're opportunistic feeders, so they are looking for anything that they can eat, and they're not being picky about it, which is why you might often see your raccoon in your garbage can or rummaging around through some things you left out in their yard because they're looking for the best food source and in the best opportunity that they can find it in. Raccoons are notable for their incredibly smart behavior in regards to getting into things that they're not supposed to be getting into. Scientific research shows that once a raccoon learns a behavior, such as maybe opening a box or solving a puzzle, that they can remember how to do that behavior for up to three years at a time. And that's truly incredible work. So if a raccoon figures out how to get into your garbage can and then maybe relocates to a different one later, they're going to know how to get into that same garbage can because they're able to remember those same concepts. Their incredibly smart brain shows here with Miko as he's able to rummage around through his toys and puzzles using his sense of smell to find the food and then his hands and other senses to rip through the product in order to get it out. So with raccoons being so incredibly intelligent, this makes training for them very, very easy. And something that we like to do here at the museum is to provide training for our animals in order to make sure that veterinary care is easier for them as well as easier for us. Currently, we are training with Miko a voluntary injection behavior. You may have seen this before in some of our other Facebook Lives regarding the Bobcats, but we're doing something very similar with Miko as well. We do an up behavior where he puts his entire body up onto the fence so we can see his underbelly and his underside. And then he'll put himself, as he's kind of showing you now, into a chute where we are able to then use a syringe with no needle at this time to kind of apply pressure to the spot where the injection would be. Over time, he will get used to the fact that there was pressure applied to that spot. And then we will introduce a needle when the injection is then necessary. We usually provide injections once a year during their yearly vet checkups. Well, I hope that you guys enjoyed learning a little bit about Miko and a little bit about the wild raccoons that inhabit all over here in Cleveland and in North America. And we can't wait to have everybody here back at the museum on July 1st. See you then. Uh, now you're fine. Okay. Boy, thank you, Nicole. That was fabulous. To see Miko up close and to see all of those behaviors and learn about what albinism is and just how cool raccoons are. You know, one of the things that makes them cool is that they're very much a part of the, the fauna of Ohio. They have a wide distribution, not only here in the state, but, but beyond. But you, we find them in just about every habitat. They do like water, though. And as Nicole said, you know, oftentimes you'll see them at the edge of a marsh or a pond, and it looks like they're washing their food. Kind of looks like they're following the advice from the CDC for COVID-19, you know, washing their food. It's not washing, it's just they have an incredible tactile sense in their feet. And they use that to be able to explore, sometimes without even looking, maybe looking up at another raccoon in a tree, but they can be feeling around and they might feel a tadpole or a fish or a crayfish and be able to grab it with their feet. And I have two casts of a forepaw and a hind paw of a raccoon, and you see the very distinctive and very elegant long um, digits that make a very distinctive footprint. And if you're ever near any body of water, or even in a muddy place in your backyard, if you see something that looks like a little handprint in the mud, it's most likely going to be a raccoon. And you see the hind uh, paw has got a much, much larger uh, surface area that engages the, um, the, the ground. And by the way, if you have questions, Put them in the comment section and we'll see if we can answer them for you. Now, if we had a normal raccoon, a normal colored raccoon, it would look much like the pelt that you see in front of me. 
Raccoons have that very characteristic banded tail. And also on their face, they have that black mask. Um, those of you who are fans of Guardians of the Galaxy, perhaps you remember Rocket, the very clever sort of wisecracking uh, raccoon that always has the largest weapon. Uh, he's one of my favorite characters in that. But that's the typical coloration. You find lots of variations on a theme. Some are blonder, some are grayer, some are browner. Um, and, uh, but, but they all fit into the st standard um, raccoon pelage, P-E-L-A-G-E, -E, which is what the term we give for the fur coat of a mammal. And I have this little model here that really is a good illustration of the posture of a, a raccoon. When you see them, if I put it down here, oftentimes you see them with sort of that arched back appearance. So they're not sleek and stretched out. They're an interesting animal, though. They have attributes of them that seem dog-like, some attributes that seem cat-like, some attributes that seem bear-like. And they're in their own family, the Procyonidae, and their scientific name is Procyon Lotor. But they've got kind of curious combination of all of these attributes, some cat-like behaviors, um, some dog-like behaviors, some bear-like behaviors. They are omnivores meaning they'll eat anything. And I do have a skull here. Now, this is a skull of a very old um, raccoon. And one of the ways we can tell that is that you can see that it's, been, it's got a very a cracked and worn canine tooth right here. And you can actually see some pathology. It probably had an abscess of that and might have caused this animal a lot of pain, missing some teeth and tremendous amount of wear on the molars. So this was not a young animal. But typically, you would find the large canine teeth, and those are useful for any predator or carnivore for grabbing its prey. But they also have generous chewing surfaces on their molars, so if they're eating fruits or veg vegetation or other types of things, that, that, actually can, um, uh, that they can process that food as well. And you see, when you look at the overall skull, the comparatively short muzzle. Okay, so uh, something like a fox, the muzzle would come out much further, or of a dog. Um, whereas something like a cat, a bobcat or a domestic cat, the muzzle would be a little bit shorter. So that's just how, face, how far the rostrum sticks out from their face. So this is a very, very distinctive and a pretty common skull that you might find in the woods. Though I must tell you that if an animal dies, and its flesh is eaten by all the scavengers, and all that remains is the skeleton, there is a whole host of things that will eat the skeleton. We call them rodents. They'll come along and they'll gnaw on the bone to get a little bit of calcium from it. And oftentimes, if you take a look at a skull or any kind of bone you find in nature, you might find these parallel scratch marks or striations on the skull, and that would be typical of the fact that rodents have been gnawing on it. So raccoons, again, they're incredibly common, typically nocturnal or crepuscular, and that's just a word means that they are active at dawn and at dusk. We sometimes see them out during the daytime, particularly in the spring when food is kind of hard to find before plants start growing and the world starts awakening from its winter slumber. Um, so seeing a raccoon during the daytime doesn't necessarily mean it's diseased. Um, but they are a potential rabies vector. So if you ever encounter a raccoon and it comes towards you, it has no fear of you, then we recommend you do your best to stay away from them. Other than that, raccoons keep their distance from people, except when you have garbage. Because of course, everything being an omnivore, eating both meat and vegetables and fruits, a lot of the stuff that you throw in your garbage can is perfectly good food for a raccoon. So yes, they do dumpster dive, don't hold that against them. And oftentimes it's amazing how deftly they can use their forepaws to open up the top of a garbage can and get inside. And I gotta tell you a story, a cool story from a long time ago. We had uh, three raccoons here at the time, and we were approached by our friends at the Rubbermaid Company who wanted to create the new predator-proof garbage can. And so they had created three prototypes. 
and they wanted to test them out with our real live raccoons. So one by one, we'd take these garbage cans, we'd put them in the raccoon enclosure, we'd put some fish inside, and then we'd close the lid, and then we'd set back, and with a camera going, we'd see, well, what happens? Well, it turns out the raccoons were brilliant. Sometimes they didn't even pop the top. They just flexed the side of the, um, of the garbage can, slipped in, got the fish, and slipped out, and the top was still sitting engaged with the top of the garbage can. The one garbage can that, that thwarted them actually had a screw top and bungee cords, and they just couldn't figure out how to unscrew. They could get a bungee cord off, but they couldn't figure out how to unscrew the top. So um, at the end of the day, the, the score was uh, Rubbermaid 1, Raccoons 2. So they're pretty intelligent animals. They use those dextrous forepaws to get into all sorts of mischief, but boy, those are important for them in grabbing food. And they are wonderful climbing animals. And oftentimes you'll find them up in a tree. And typically they'll have a, a hole in a tree, a natural cavity, and that's where they um, both weather out the worst weather, they'll f that's where you'll find them during the daytime, and also that's where the mom will have her youngsters. A really fascinating animal. The first thing that I would encourage everyone to do is when it rains, go out in your backyard and find a place where maybe there's some bare soil that when mixed with the rain becomes mud, and look and see if you might find some animal footprints in it. Maybe it's a footprint of your cat or your dog, but if you see a footprint that looks like a little hand this size, you're looking at the footprint of a raccoon, and that's proof positive that the raccoon lives in your neighborhood. Okay, we've got a couple questions. Megan would like to know, what is the lifespan for raccoons in captivity versus the wild? Great question, Megan. She asked, what's the lifespan of raccoons in captivity versus the wild? So there's an awful lot of things that cause mortality in raccoons in the wild, disease being a big one of them. They get diseases of dogs and cats, um, so distemper, um, uh, parvovirus, all of these are things that they're susceptible to. Um, if you're out in nature, you know, there are things that might prey upon the babies. Um, so you might have a tough time getting through your adolescent period to become an adult. And then if you're an adult, there are times when food is scarce, there's time when food is, is um, uh, abundant. And if times when food is scarce can be difficult in terms of surviving and getting through the winter can be a tough issue too. So it's hard to say a specific average, but I would think that a raccoon could live to be four to six years in the wild. In captivity, we've had raccoons live to be 18 years of age. Um, I don't, I'm not even sure I know what the record is, but we've had them here at this institution at age 18. Um, Kelly, a raccoon that just passed away um, a couple of years ago, was 18. So that's a pretty remarkable um, difference. Why, of course, in captivity, they go to the veterinarian, they're vaccinated against those diseases, they get a wonderful food supply, they see the veterinarian once a year. So we, we enrich them, we um, try and keep them in tip-top health. So you would expect that they would have their longest potential lifespan actually in captivity. We have one more uh, from Carl. He would like to know if raccoons have any relation to any prehistoric mammals. Carl wants to know what the relationship with raccoons with prehistoric animals. And yes, there are uh, um, a whole host of things on the family tree of the Procyonides and and where also the, the raccoon and raccoon-like animals, um, where they stem and share common ancestors with other mammalian carnivores like cats and like dogs and with bears. I can't rattle off the names of some of those fossil animals, but, but um, actually the, the fossil record is, is replete with lots of fossils of mammalian carnivores. Megan would like to know what is Nico's favorite treat? Miko's favorite treat. Well, you know what? I wish Nicole was still on camera. We could ask that question. I will tell you that they love fish. So Miko loves smelt. So smelt are small fish, kind of minnow-sized from the Great Lakes. We get them frozen, thaw them out. Boy, that tastes awfully good. Um, they like a carnivore diet. They love fresh 
fruit. But I'd probably have to say that uh, they like sweet treats too. We don't give them a lot of sweet treats, but um, I do know that some raccoons are partial to marshmallows. Go figure. One last question. Um, so say you do have a raccoon getting into your trash. Is there a very humane way to deter them from doing so? Okay, so the question is how do we keep them out of the trash can? Well, most of the trash cans that you get that have got the articulated lid that's reasonably heavy, um, most of them are pretty good about keeping raccoons out. Uh, they get into my, my um, dumpster f at home from time to time. Sometimes just the simple use of a bungee cord that you hook around the front, go across the top of the back, and then back to the front and hook it on there, puts enough pressure there that the raccoon can't get enough leverage to open it up. So we would recommend one budgie cord. If that doesn't work, I would try two. So, um, and, but by all means, make sure that your garbage and your trash is in a container. If you have just, if you're in a community that gathers trash bags off a tree lawn, if you just have a, a plastic bag with trash in it, that's, uh, they'll make quick work of it as they'll tear open the plastic to get the food inside. And if you're thinking, wow, but I like them in my neighborhood, so if I want to keep them on the trash can, should I feed them? We recommend that you don't feed any wild mammal. If you have a bird feeding station, great. Um, but recognize if you have a bird feeder, you're not feeding them because they would starve without your food. You're feeding them to attract them so that you can see them. As long as you understand that they can live without that, that's good. But with mammals like raccoons and even squirrels, they will get habituated to you as a source of food. And if you've been feeding them for several weeks and then you stop, and they show up with an empty belly expecting to get fed. We've had raccoons tear apart screen porches and do all sorts of damage trying to get into the house in a desperate search for food. So please don't feed wild mammals like raccoons. Okay, so that's all the questions we've had. I hope you've enjoyed this edition of Wildlife Wednesday and Nicole's great interaction with Miko our albino raccoon at the Ralph Perkins 2 Wildlife Center in Woods Garden, presented by Key Bank. And we certainly hope that we see you here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, particularly after we open back up to the public on July 1st. I'm Harvey Webster. Be well. <laughs>